Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knapp. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. Today's episode, we're going to throw a little bit of a curveball at Right. You. We're going to do a, a movie called New York Story. It was originally called New York Stories. <laughs> But uh, only one of them is, is really worth talking about. Uh, the one by Woody Allen is not really that great. Eh. The one by Francis Ford Coppola is uh, unwatchable. Uh-uh. And <laughs> I like the sound effect, John. And we have Life Lessons here. It's directed by... Martin Scorsese. And your boy, written by your boy, John. Richard Price. Richard Price from the Bronx. From the Bronx. Your old neighborhood. Yes. And uh, I have to say one thing about uh, an aspect of it. The whiter shade of pale never looked so good. (laughs) Scorsese is certainly notable for his music scores, but this one really works with this film. So we mentioned Martin Scorsese. We actually have done a Martin Scorsese film before. Alice doesn't live here anymore. Uh, and we've done a movie with Rosanna Arquette, right. who's in this. So right. it's got some interesting Eight pair. million ways to die. Uh, so Martin Scorsese, we all know. We've talked about him. Great director. We love him to death. Uh, I mean, he's easy to talk about because, uh, you know, he's, he's done a million movies. We all know those movies. One movie that I think a terrific movie was really his first feature. Who's that knocking at my door with with Harvey Keitel? Yeah, and I I, I want to say that if if you haven't seen that one, check that one out. It's really worth watching, and you can really see the artist beginning to get his footing. Beautiful yeah. stuff, great stuff. And interestingly, that movie and his next big film, Mean Streets, right, and another New York movie of his, After Hours, right, all take place within blocks of this movie, Life Lessons. <laughs> yes. It's all downtown, all downtown New York where he grew yeah, up. Indeed. And and there's something about that atmosphere or neighborhood that just really he knows how to do. I mean, it works. In That's his, his place. Yeah. That's where he comes from, and he knows his stuff. As we said, written by Richard Price. Richard Price has written for Martin Scorsese before. He right. wrote The Color of Money. Uh-huh. I know him as, and he's really a novelist. He's a great novelist. The Wanderers. Uh, the Wanderers is his first book about a gang in the Bronx. One uh, of our favorite, John, uh, is Ladies Man. Ladies Man. Yes. Blood Brothers, which uh-huh. was made into a movie, Richard Gere. Right. And another movie, I'll just mention that he, he, he Richard Price gets around. He wrote Sea of Love with Al right. Pacino. Which is a really good script, which they screwed up at the end because they changed the whole ending. Right. But all these movies have something in common. It's just Richard Price has a certain kind of New York dialogue that just is really true, very snappy, very cynical. You, very cynical. You can't beat his dialogue, period. Yeah. yeah. And he wrote uh, uh, several episodes for the HBO show The Deuce. Yeah, another one of our favorite uh, <laughs> milieus. Is that how you say that? I guess you would. Times Square yes. of old. Well, that's chock full of subject matter. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and I want to mention something about yeah. Morton Scorsese's editor, because it really is, when you think about it, only one editor. It's Thelma Schumacher. I mean, they're they're like, you know, two parts of a whole. Yeah. And and they really work so well together. And and. She started with his his film, Who's That Knocking at My Door? She did Woodstock. She did Raging Bull, which she won an Academy Award for. And everything Martin Scorsese, except uh, Alice doesn't live here anymore. When you watch this movie, it's so beautifully edited. Yeah. And I know they work together as as editor and director. They really work closely right. together. It's not just somebody throws her the dailies and she puts it together. They work yeah. as a team, but it's really beautifully edited, this film. Well, it's one of the best movies I've ever seen besides maybe the um, Lust for Life about an, an artist. artist. Yes. And, and the editing of how they put together his painting episodes and yeah. this is just amazing. Beautiful. And and then we have the star, Nick Nolte. This guy's been around for a long time. Yeah. He goes back to 1969 doing Death Valley Days. I didn't even know he went that far back, to be honest with you. But he was on every television show imaginable coming up in, in the 60s and 70s. Canon he was on. Emergency, The Rookies. Uh, the streets, streets of San, San Francisco. Francisco. He beat me to it. Yeah. But the thing that really made him a star, which the, was the miniseries Rich Man, Poor Man, that made him a household name. Then he was in, you know, The Deep with Jacqueline Bisset. That's actually a pretty good movie. It, it was funny. Everyone thought it was kind of the sequel to Jaws because right. it was written by the same writer. Right, but it's not. It's more like a thriller. Yeah. It takes place in the Caribbean. And Jacqueline uh, Bisset is a hell of a swimmer. Uh, another film he was in, which is from a great novel called Dog Soldiers, uh, Who'll Stop the Rain? I was just going to say that. Right. Um, exactly. Carol Reese. And That's a real good movie. 
Yeah. He's also in, you know, uh, lighter stuff too, like 48 Hours with Eddie Murphy, which is a really fun movie. He's got the most gravelly voice I think he's, he's ever done on film before in that. Yeah, all right. You and could... he's also in a really great movie called Under Fire. Yes, with Gene Hackman and Ed Harris. And, uh, and Joanna Cassidy, who's really terrific in as well. He was also in a Paul Schrader film, which is really troubling. It's called Affliction. Yes. With James Colbert, who plays his father. And uh, he's really, really good in that. And I just don't want to forget, because he's one of our favorite directors, Q&A, Sidney Lamette. Yes. He plays a corrupt New York cop, and yeah. boy, is he yeah, very dirty. Dirty and really weird and really strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, our co-star, Rosanna Arquette. Yeah, Rosanna Arquette. She is really a terrific actress. She's really beautiful. And it's easy to say, oh, she's just a, a beautiful blonde. But no, she's a she's terrific not. actress. She's a great actress. I first remember seeing her in, in a movie, uh, it was John Sayles' film, called Baby It's You. Yeah. That's when she really struck me for the first time. With Vincent Spano. Vincent Spano, right. <laughs> that's, a, that's also a really good movie. Trenton makes, the world takes. <laughs> takes place in Trenton. <laughs> yep. And she was in Desperately Seeking Susan with Madonna. Yeah. After Hours, we just mentioned that. Eight Million Ways to Die a show we did before that. So if you haven't seen that one, check yeah. that one out. And a quick aside, Nestor Alamandros, the cinematographer. Yeah, a great cinematographer. Long, long career, has done all kinds of stuff. The French New Wave and all a lot of great French films from the 60s and 70s. He did a little movie called Days of Heaven. That that looks pretty good, doesn't it, John? One of the most beautifully shot films Yeah, it's ever. incredible. It's Funny enough, this is the only movie he's worked with Scorsese on. That's true. But he did, he did a ton of stuff. He did Sophie's Choice... I, he did a great Truffaut movie that I think is kind of an unsung Truffaut movie called The Wild Child. It's a beautiful movie, and it looks beautiful. And I'll just say, Going South, Jack Nicholson. <laughs> That's, Believe it or not. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> he also did a, a, a couple of really terrific French films by Eric Romer, Chloe in the Afternoon and Pauline at the Beach. Yes. I love Romer. And here's one, John, something we saw many years ago, Matrius, with... Gerard Depardieu, and I got to tell you, that is one sexy movie. That's a great movie. It Bar really is. Barbet Schroeder. Yeah. So you know, when when I was when I was preparing for this uh, the show, I I actually found it hard to take notes because the scenes are so beautifully visualized, the dialogue is so snappy, and the music is intoxicating that I had to keep going back and going, oh, I I, I forgot to write that down. I, I want to mention that thing. I don't understand how Martin Scorsese is able to take a famous piece of music that we all know yeah. and put it into a film. He creates these visuals around it, mm -hmm. and it, it just takes this piece of music and just shoots it through the roof. You just, it transfixes you while you're watching this thing, and it's, it's not like, okay, I'm just listening to this song. It becomes one. Yeah. And it, it, it arrests you when, you, when you're watching it. A perfect example of, of a, film, a Scorsese film is, is Mean Streets, where you see the introduction of Johnny Boy coming in to the bar, and you have Jumpin' Jack Flash. Now, what does Jumpin' Jack Flash have to do with this? Exactly? <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference. How does he understand to use that piece of music in that manner? I don't get it. And then, in this case... He uses the wider shade of pale, you know, yeah. like a painter uses a brush. I mean, it's incredible what he does with that song. I mean, I never really thought of that song as like, it's a great song. I, after watching this, I can't, can't get it out of my head. Impossible. And, but I think he uses music, like if you, the Johnny Boy thing, it becomes like the soundtrack to your life in a way. Right. It's like the emotion of that moment. Somehow he knows which how music does he pick. To pick. The right song? I don't know. So it opens up one wider shade of pale. Right. And we see this iris shot, which is basically everything in the frame exactly. is dark except for the circle. And it's an old device from like silent Vignetting. Era. It isolates the image. You're you know, focused you're on focused, one point. You're focused right into it. Exactly. Yeah. But he's taken this device and putting it in, in a modern time. Yeah. And it works so effectively. And he does a lot of that in his films. There's always, throughout his films, some kind of nod to cinema or something, right. technique, you know, some technique from old cinema. Exactly. And in the opening shot, you have this 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 canvas. Yeah. And and you're you're looking at this this painter trying to work out this new painting he's doing, and and the, the way the camera moves and it goes past the brushes, and there there's one point there's a there's a whole bunch of 
paint and paint caps and this big mass of paint and there's even a cigar stuck in it. It reminds me of a, a Pollock painting because there yeah, actually yeah. is a cigarette right. in one of Pollock's paintings. Whatever fell into right. the painting. Uh, yeah, and there's also like uh, you see his feet shuffling. Yeah. It's this guy at work, basically. Right. And he really somehow gets into this guy's head. You this feel artist. the tension in this yeah. guy's body. His his arms are dangling, but his his hand is clenching a cigarette. You know, like he would right. hold a hammer or something. You know, and he's and he's and he's fiddling with his his rag to wipe his hands off. Like he's 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 so intense about. Yeah. He doesn't know what to do. He's shuffling back and forth, shuffling back and forth, and you get right into this guy's head, like you said. You know, you see this loft, now it's probably like $10 million. Yeah. But back then, it was just like this guy's artist loft. Right. And uh, we hear the buzzer. Right. And we hear this elevator. And in, in these classic old buildings, it's like a freight elevator. Yeah. We look down the in shaft. A cage. You're in a cage when you're driving. And we right see here. the yeah. elevator coming up. And it's Patrick O'Neill. Yeah. And he's really good in this. I mean, and it's not yeah. an actor I really think that much about. No, yeah. But he's perfect for this role. Yeah. And he plays uh, his agent. This guy's Lionel Doby. Yeah. And and this guy, his agent, is coming up in the in the cage, he and he want, wants to, he wants to see the goods. Yeah. So basically, what do you got? We, well, we learn he's got a show coming up in right. three weeks. Right. And apparently, that's why this guy's nervous. He's got this show, and he's he's trying to finish this major work. So in, in answer to that question, he says it's 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 shit. It's it's the emperor's <laughs> emperor's new clothes. I'm gonna get slaughtered. Like every artist before the opening, panic. he's like panic. Panic. So, so his his agent says, "Well, you know, I got to see something because it's it's in three weeks." And you see this horrified, panic expression on Lionel Dobie's face. And what does he do? He hits the down button of the elevator, <laughs> and it just goes right back down. The guy's looking up at him. <laughs> he's like, "You go through this before every show." Is he's every going show, down the show? Twenty years. <laughs> so we cut to the airport, and he's picking up. His assistant, played by Rosanna Arquette, her name is Paulette. And what's really great is, once again, what Scorsese does with the camera is so beautiful. It's a close-up shot, and the camera just moves past until it gets his face yeah. right up into a close-up. Right. And he's smoking a cigarette, and it's in slow motion. Yeah. And he's waiting, and he's he looks anxious, and he's waiting. And finally, he sees her. This vision and that same vignette. Yes, we see that exactly. small vignette. She's coming up the runway. We isolate on who's this character, and it's Paulette, yeah. this woman he's been waiting for, his assistant. And we can see how he feels for her. Yeah. The relief on his face once he sees her. He's like, oh, thank God. He drops his cigarette, and then he, in slow motion, he stamps it into the carpet. Ground. Of the airport. <laughs> but the thing that's interesting to me is how Scorsese makes that little close-up of a cigarette being right. squashed, arresting. Well, it's clearly in a couple of shots, tight shots, this guy's upset. You see how obsessed he is. Yes. And when you see the vision of this girl walking. And she's a vision. It's his point of view. Right. But I don't know. Somehow the, the makeup, the wardrobe, she looks like every fantasy I've ever had <laughs> of a downtown New York art girl. You bet. You know what I mean? Like You bet. I mean, somehow Rosanna Arquette embodies everyone. She really does. Yeah. She really does. There's no doubt about it. And what, what's interesting about her is, is is she can be sexy, she can be bitchy, and she could be a little girl. And sometimes, within the matter of seconds, she can she can transfer from one to the next to the next. She's really she's really that good of an actress. <laughs> but so the relief the really the yeah. relief on his face when he finally sees her because you know he he he, he just his, everything about him changes. And well, we quickly learn that he lied to the uh, the agent because he's like, I had to pick up my my assistant, right. and she's like, What are you doing here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and she says, I called you. I, I left a message on your machine, and he goes, Well, I didn't get it. She goes, You should listen to your machine, and and Lionel Doby says, He goes, Listen to your machine. Doesn't that have a horrifying ring to it? <laughs> <laughs> that expression, you listen to your machine. Yeah. Now, that's brilliant Richard Price right there. Yeah. <laughs> Even back then, he's a Luddite. You know, he doesn't want to do with the answering machine. Exactly. So we find out that she's she was supposed to go to Florida with her girlfriend, but she ended up going with a guy. His name is Gregory Stark, and he's a, a performance artist, quote unquote. Right. But they had a fight. You can tell, like, right. she's coming back. She's really agitated, yeah. and, and and she's really tense. And Lionel, if you're a guy, 
you know that feeling. At some point in your life, you had this feeling of jealousy. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. It's just like a gut feeling sure. of some other person. You don't even know, but they have the attention of the girl you're it's, interested it's in. It's lizard brain stuff, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> and you could see Lionel right away. He's so like, he because he's obsessed with this girl. Yes. And the fact that she went away with somebody. He blah, tries blah, blah. to pretend it's not that big a deal, but you can tell he's hurt by it. But he's like, he's like. Performance artist. He calls him a comedian. Yeah. Performance <laughs> artist. A person's a singer, a dancer. <laughs> what do you call the guy who picks up your garbage? A sanitary engineer? <laughs> Performance artist. So she says, that's it. I'm done. I, 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 I'm, I'm moving out. I'm leaving New York. I want to go home. Yeah. And Lionel says to her, you want to split? Fine. Come back. Pack up and go. When you drag it out, I'll die. You know that. So the fact that he just is such a raw nerve yeah. is so upsetting to watch. Yeah. You know, you're watching yeah, yeah. somebody being tortured. And this is only five minutes. We get all of this in five minutes, and then boom, we cut to the credits, life lessons. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Well, also, the tension she has, because she wants to be this artist and live in this downtown art world. Sure. But there's also this part of her that wants to go home. Right. And there's reasons we the little, see. The little girl part of her. Yeah. Uh, and when we get back to the loft, she goes upstairs. I just have to say, when she goes up the stairs, she lives in this little room on top of the loft. There's a little stairway. So already it's like- It's like the little princess in a tower. Yeah. You know? But she's like his assistant. Yeah. She's his muse. She lives in his apartment, yeah. in his loft. His loft. And as a window, she's got a hole in the wall. My take on that crudely opened wall window is- I think she is treated like a princess. Right. And I think she probably said at one point, I, I, I don't have enough light up here. I only have that one window and I can't see anything. And and, 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 and I need a window. So I, I can see Lionel Doe beginning up on a ladder yeah. with a sledgehammer because you can see it's banged it's through. It's just right through the So I don't think rock. that's accidental at all. I oh, think no. That's the yeah, yeah. Looks so crudely. I, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> anything for you, darling. <laughs> So she's back in her room packing. Right. And they have this little argument yeah. uh, about, you know, she wants to go home. And he's like, how can you let a guy like that drive you out of New York? Right. He knows how to work her. Absolutely. Like, he's working this whole angle that you're working. Hey, you're working for me. You're getting, you know, he's got a whole bunch of You're working for the lion. The lion. And you're getting paid. You're my assistant. You're stretching canvas. Where else are you going to find this? Right. It is like you're working for Jackson Pollock. He's sure. that high in the world. Absolutely. And think about it. If you're 22, you're a wannabe painter. Where else are you going to be that gets this access? So right. she's like caught between a rock and a hard place. So he's trying to work it, work it, work it. And as he's doing his work and he sees her fold up her white panties and you can just see this expression on his face. Well, it's a great edit, right? Because it's like that close-up of his eyes, practically. He's he's glazed over. You can see that this guy is obsessed with oh, her. Oh, yeah. This is actually based on Dostoevsky and his mistress. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Her name was Polina Soslova. He later wrote the book The Gambler uh -huh. about this basic, basically this thing. But Scorsese read diaries uh, when these books were re-released, he read the diaries that came along with it, and he learned that Dostoevsky, he was obsessed with his assistant, and she was she fancied herself a writer. She wanted to become a writer. It's very much like this. Yeah. Richard Price decided it would be more visual, right. be better not to talk about writing and typing and whatnot, but to show something, and sure. I, I, I think he made a good decision on that one. Plus, back in the 80s, like art, but it was such a big deal. Absolutely. In New York at that time. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. The thing that fascinated Scorsese was the pain that this artist needs in order to work. And he creates so much of this tension and so much of this pain himself. Yeah. He's also obsessed by her feet, <laughs> as was Dostoevsky and his mistress. You feel bad for him in a way because she clearly is over him. Obviously, she realized he's a great artist, but there's no emotional attachment to him anymore. There may have been. Right. Because she was, in fact, you know, whatever, he was a big star. But now she's done. And it's creepy in a way. He's mid-40s, 50. He's up there. Right. And she's very young. It's she's not 22. The first, it's not the first time it's happened, John. And <laughs> so it is kind of odd that she's living there. And But he, again, he keeps he works working it. her. 
he says, what about your painting? You, you, you're going to make a little studio in your parents' garage? Ouch, right? <laughs> Ouch. With the rusty hedge clippers hanging on a nail, pool stuff laying in the corner, broken sled, mice. You work for Lionel Doby. You work for the lion, baby. And that's pretty intoxicating stuff. And how can you possibly give it up? He's really selling himself really well. You know, he does say this, and it really does, because we've all been there in a way, like, you leave now, I swear you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. Because this is, if she wants to ever become something, she's she's got to jump in. It's suicide, Yeah, he says. Yeah. This is a time and a place, and at your age, forget it. She's like, okay, I don't have to sleep with you anymore? Yeah, this is where he's almost got, you know, what he thinks he's going to get. And she goes, okay, I don't have to sleep with you exactly. anymore. Exactly. She doesn't want to have that relationship. And you could feel the punch in the solar plexus. So what's cool about the next part is he's kind of a little bit re-inspired, but he goes down to his loft. He starts playing basketball. Procrastinate. He's procrastinating. Any well, he's procrastinate trying to get something going. Yeah, but you know that, and John. He's when you're around. trying to write something or do something, it's like, okay, let me go wait, empty the waste paper basket. But he takes a shot. He's, he's still, you know, and then he throws the ball through the hole in her room, right. in the window. And she yells at him, throws it back. He goes up, he goes, <laughs> then he goes up and he, he says, anything to get in the room. Yeah. I think I left my sable brushes here. <laughs> uh, you, you want something to eat? You want some soup? And she looks at him and goes, He's so soup? concerned, isn't he? Soup? Soup? It's like three in the morning. Yeah, I'll have some soup. Thanks. And then we see him going at his painting. So basically rebuffed, he goes downstairs. He hits the cassette player. What comes on? The Politician by Cream. Ah. <clears throat> exactly. <clears throat> you and know, once again, I knew it was Cream. I could not but, think of the song. But once again, the thing is this. How does he think of this song to do for this thing? Because it works so well. I mean, look, as if that's, it's he grew it. up in that time period. He, that's like his music, you know. Like I in understand a way. that, yeah. and I love that song, you know, because yeah. it's 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 a cool song. It's got a great riff and 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 Jack Bruce's voice. But the thing is, how do you know that song is going to work for that thing? I, right. I don't understand how he does it. Lionel Doby, he's fueled by this, yeah, and the intensity of the song, and, and he just starts grabbing paint. And brush and starts laying this stuff down. I love the close-ups where he's like smashing paint yeah. into the canvas. Yeah. It's a violent act. He's attacking it, and the and the and the and the camera is is dolling parallel to the canvas as he's moving about on it, and the painting is starting to take some shape. He's finally broken that uh, creative block. But then he ends up back in her room, turns the light on. She's sleeping. Right. She's like, "Don't you knock?" Yeah, she's, she wakes up, she turns the light on, she's totally disoriented and kind of freaked out. A guy just, in your room! Right. He goes, oh. I did. I thought you said come in. <laughs> I thought you said come in. Oh, man. Sure. I, sure like, you did. In a way, my heart just fell for him because I know that feeling. You're like the the dog out in the rain. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like you're just trying to get into that doghouse. Well, it, 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 you got uh, uh, Percy Sledge. <laughs> Sleep out in the rain. Yeah. If that's the way she says it ought to be. <laughs> He says he's looking for a sable brush. Anything to just stay in a room. It's just stay close <laughs> enough with her. He comes into the room, and while he's standing there, he just starts staring at her foot. And then he just says, I, I just had this impulse to kiss your foot. Sorry, it's nothing personal. Nothing personal. But that's it in a nutshell. Like, she's become this object of beauty to him. She's right. not a real thing anymore. So, so there's a point where she just is going to play with him. And she says, so do you love me? And she has this seductive smile. And... At the same time she has the seductive smile, she still looks like this little girl, really yeah. innocent with these freckles. And so he, he hears this and he climbs up on the bed like, you know, like, like you said, use the term dog, like a little dog and, and, and like, oh, oh, good, maybe there's a chance here. Right? <laughs> Something can happen here. And he goes, oh, yes, I, I did. I, I said yes. <laughs> and she says, you know, what would you, what would you do if I left? I, 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 I'd go up on the roof and howl like a gut shot dog. And you see how hopeful he is. It's pathetic. And then she has to say it. Well, I don't love you. Yeah. So this kind of tension, being uh, stepped on by her, 
it feeds him because he goes right back to painting. That's what I'm saying. And that's, somehow that's, this is like that's the Dostoevsky thing where he needed this this the pain and suffering yeah. in order to create. And what's that song? Night and day, it's, the chorus. It's it's it's, uh, it's a Ray Charles song. Ray Charles. It's night and day, and and Margie Hendricks yeah. from the Raylettes okay. is singing the lead. So it's it's basically. You need me, right. and then the realist night and day. You yeah. need me. She's screaming it out, and you're thinking, boy, oh boy, yeah. does he need her? You can see it's actually dawn now. This yeah. has been going on all night. Right, right, right. Like there's light coming through the window. Yes, yes. So they're in her studio. They're looking at these abstract paintings right, right. Uh, of figures, right. um, and she wants his opinion. You have a great irony <laughs> going on here. He doesn't know what to say, and she wants him to tell her the truth. She so much wants validation. She wants to be validated by him. And he can't even do that somehow. Like, right. what I don't understand is, why didn't you just tell her, you know, how, how about a variety of color over here with some red and some green? Yeah. That would lighten it up. He looks at it the way I see it. He looks at the art and just goes, well, I don't know what to say about this. But he says to her, right? He's, he comes out with it. He's like, what the hell difference does it matter? What I think. You make art because you... You have to. You have no choice. Finally, Lionel gets mad and says, you know, you want to give it up. If, if you want to give it up, you were never a real artist to begin with. Right. And he stomps out. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Oops. And, he, and he, 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 he just says to himself, you idiot, you yeah. idiot. What a stupid thing to say. Because it's the dumbest thing you could possibly say. So she's crushed. She's completely crushed. So she, it, there's a really sweet scene of her, and once again, what a terrific actress she is. She's upstairs in a room on the floor, and she's talking to her mother, and she says, "Right, I want to come home." Yeah, and you see what a little girl she is at this point. Go back to school, she says. She wants and to go back but to you school. can you only hear it from one side, which is really yeah. really neat. And <laughs> and and you you could tell the mother said for what because she goes, "I don't know." Well, it's almost like I almost I, I don't know if this is true or not. To me, I kind of hear the mothers thinking this again, like it's a cycle <laughs> with her. You know what I mean? Like she's just kind of being encouraging, sure. but like, yeah, whatever. Sure. You know, come home if you want, whatever. And then you can tell that on the other end, of the, the, the thing is, you know, why do you want to come home now? You know, you 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 <laughs> left in the first place, and she says, because I hated you. Which is, you know, most teenagers, you know, right. hate their parents at a certain point because they don't understand them. <laughs> so she's a real little girl at this point. She was cast iron bitch, you know, uh, uh, a couple of scenes ago, and now she's just this little broken girl. So he's now back to painting, and he puts on the Dylan song. Yeah, he's really fueled by this song. It's a great uh, live version of uh, Like a Rolling Stone from uh, Before the Flood with, with, the, now, with the band. Talk about an interesting choice of music. Not. Yeah. The studio version, the live version, which has a whole different energy. Absolutely positive. It's, it's crazy. It, it works perfectly. Yeah. It works perfectly. Uh, and he's working feverishly at this canvas, finally. How does it feel? <laughs> but, I mean, he's really going, it's a beautiful scene. It's Because like the energy, he is fueled like, by the energy of this song, and he is just... He's just grabbing a paintbrush and slapping it down. Yeah. These, these brutal strokes. Like hand, he uses his hand. He's like, yeah, he 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 uses a a galvanized trash can lid as his palette. And he's got right. this stuff all in here, so he can just <laughs> grab when he wants to go. He's using his fingers, and you could just see, here he is. He yeah. is the artist. He's got it, whatever it is, and he is just going at it. When the, and, and and it's cut so beautifully into the music where you see you see paint and, and then you see you grab the brush and and slap it on there and then you see canvas and you see the the painting start to develop these little little tiny vignettes inside the painting and then she shows up right interestingly and she just kind of stares yes you see this look on her Absolutely. face of awe basically Absolutely. because you're watching a genius at right. work now if I'm in her shoes. That's when I pack my bag and leave because it's like, I can't do that. You you were never gonna be that. I, I can't I mean, do that. You may be a decent artist, right. but you're not gonna be Lionel Doby. Just set up set up a nice little studio in your parents' garage with the pool stuff in the corner. <laughs> but it's great how she just watches him and, and, and you watch like, her the look face. on her face. Absolutely, is just like oh yes, my yes. god. And 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 she's she's just in awe of him. Yeah, I mean she doesn't love him anymore, but she loves the artist. The artist. Absolutely. She's in awe. And you see just this, this 
this great expression on her face. There's this this light in her eyes, and she starts to not quite a full smile, but yeah, she's feeling this energy coming off of this guy. I mean, I kind of feel bad because it's the it's like a giant magnet is there, right? right? You, it's such a like you're so close to this artist. How could you walk away? But you need to get away. Absolutely. You can't break out of the force. Absolutely. So what happens is they go to this party. It's a it, it's a birthday party for the agent. Right. It's like a Park Avenue fancy party. Absolutely. And different artists, different happening people, different wannabe happening people. Rich, the rich. Yes. And Lionel, it's funny, Lionel is there, and he's just entertaining the rich guys with right. stor- war stories, right. basically. Literally. It's kind of funny. Yeah, literally. <laughs> but you can see how he works the money people. Yes, he does. And I guess if you're that famous... That's how you make the money. You got to work these people. You got to work it too, because if yeah. you're such a such a uh, an sob, yeah, they're gonna say, "Well, that guy's a dick. I don't want his paintings." So it's interesting to see him in that mode. Yes, to work it, uh, and he's got that this Armani suit on. Yeah, <laughs> and he's still got paint in his fingernails and some on his glasses and stuff. And you know that's <laughs> and who they're he is. eating it up. <laughs> Absolutely. So so Paulette sees sees this uh, sexy Latin lover uh, graffiti artist from across the way, and they uh, kind of make their way out. Out of the place, and they go back to Lionel's apartment. Yeah. Oh my God! How how much worse can it get? He sees them leave, yep. and you just see the look on his yeah. face. Like, yeah, Rrr. terrible. <laughs> it, it's it's terrible. And then he comes home, and the curtains across that hole. And you hear, you know, her giggling like a little girl upstairs. Oh my whatnot. God! I'm, it's a knife. It's a knife you in the chest. Just torture yourself, you know. Like. It's a knife in his chest, and he stands there for a little while. Yeah. And he's visibly upset, and then he just launches into painting again. Yeah. He hits the tape deck, and it's Conquistador by Procol Harum. And once again, the energy of the song. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Muller. <laughs> Pulling that one out. Jesus Christ. The, the, you asked me about Procol Harum, I just know, uh, why do shade of power? <laughs> Conquistador. <laughs> Conquistador. <laughs> So, once again, Scorsese is able to come up with another type of visual that you just you it just blows your mind. A wide shot of the whole canvas, yeah, yeah. and he is superimposing exactly, the yeah. painter in different spots, working this canvas, right. working this canvas with this great energetic piece of music while the artist is painting this. Right, it's it, I, I've never seen anything like it. Never seen anything like it. So, at a certain point, it's late in the evening. And, and we know that because the light is now off in her room. Right. To me, that's a killer shot, too, because it's it like, is. oh, my God, they're sleeping. Yeah. You're, like, alone down the stairs. Right. And he looks upstairs. There's no noise. And it's just dark up there. And and you, you just see the heartbreak in his face. It's terrible. Yeah. He puts on uh, Nessun Dorma. Yes. Puccini. Opera. Puccini's opera. Right. Yeah. I looked it up. Nessun yeah. Dorma uh-huh. translates as "none shall sleep." Yeah, another perfect choice. Of Absolutely, music positively. Here. The thing about the song is that even if you didn't know anything no. about the song, the yeah. song is heartbreaking. Like emotionally, it just feels perfect. But the song is heartbreaking. The thing about the song is, in this opera, this guy is totally infatuated with this cold princess. And he's singing during the course of the song that he will, come the morning, be triumphant, yeah. and he will win this princess. In the opera, the only way he can ask for this princess's hand in marriage is he has to answer these three riddles. And if he gets any of these riddles wrong, mm-hmm. it's death. So he answers the three riddles. He's triumphant. He asks the woman to marry him, and she says, nah. <laughs> He just risked his life. When you really are lovesick, you put the most heartbreaking music on you can to torture yourself. So he's sitting in that chair, and and he gets up and he he walks to the he walks to the window and looks up he at it stares. like a dog in the rain, yeah. waiting for the master to come home. And there's where Zen Arquette making herself a cup of tea. Oh my goodness, standing there. In this kind of kimono, like kimono, a short kimono, 
w- completely open. Open. Nothing and she's just standing her. there in a pair of panties, and she is just. And I believe, which to me is equally sexy, like these little socks. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my god. She's just trying to destroy him. She just wants to drive him completely insane. And and that's a good way of doing it. Yeah. She finally has it out with him. And she wants to know. She wants to know right now, am I any good? Will I ever be any good? And, and all I can manage is, you're young yet. And that's it. That's the end of her staying there, period. And she leaves him one last flourish. She says... Sometimes I feel like a human sacrifice. Yeah. And that actually is what she is. Yeah. She is a human sacrifice. He cannot give to her what she needs as a human being. He can't even really be a mentor to her. So we next see her brother, who she said, he's a Marine. uh, Stay away from me. (laughs) Get out of my face. My brother's a Marine. Uh, And you know where that's going to (laughs) go. So her bags are packed and she's leaving. Um, goodbye, you know. What does she say when she leaves? If you would just come to me once and just said that you're no good. Right. That you don't have any talent. Well, that's not his job. You know what I mean? It isn't his job. And You're tough, John. <laughs> it's like, go home then. And she leaves. Uh, and I think he has I don't fo- think you're going to get a painter's apprentice with that attitude, John. <laughs> Because I can't paint for shit, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so she leaves, and, you know, he's really angry, and he's really upset, and he's he's still painting. And I love the reaction shot of when it finally sinks in. Right. He's painting with his fingertips, and he's dotting the canvas, and he's yeah. moving his fingers around, and all of a sudden, this paint-filled hand comes up and cups his face, and he's horrified about what he has just done. Well, it's an interesting shot. Like, I'm wondering what he's thinking. Like, yeah, he is it horrified that she left? Well, he says at one point, he goes, he goes, chippies. They just chip away at you. They chip away at you. I mean, your to talents. me, I could almost see it as like it's like pulling the band-aid off. Like, she's gone, but am I free in a way? You know what I mean? Like, is it over? Like now he's going forward. I don't know. I don't know if it's just as horrifying look. I didn't feel that way. Because it's, it's I think, vague to me. It's a I, vague I, look. I think, I think what he was trying to do when he was talking about the chippies, they want to, they want to just, all they want to do is just chip at you. Chip away at your art it, form. Chip yeah. away at your talent. So now I think he's free of her. But I don't think so because I think he's horrified by just being alone there. That's what, I, that's what it looked like to me. Okay. And life goes on for Lionel Dobie, doesn't it? Well, just say, that I love this, at the beginning of the art opening... You know, you see that big canvas, right. there's all these people there, and the beginning of the scene is very reminiscent of Raging Bull, because they have all these photographers. Yes. Click, 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 click. Quick, click. quick shots. Yes. It's really cool. And as you said, Richard Price makes a cameo, by the way. Hilarious. <laughs> you want to do the line, John? No, I don't want we'll to leave it. We'll leave it for the, it's not, leave it for the It's use. just a line, but it's a yeah. funny cameo. It's and... a perfect Richard Price line. <laughs> yes. You know, he, the art opening is doing very, very well. And he goes over for a glass of wine. And the painting's there above the bar, actually. Right, and it's a pretty cool painting. Did you yes. Know, it's, yes, yes. It's like a Brooklyn Bridge scene almost. I'm not, I don't there think There is a is, structure. But... It almost looks like the, like, like Roman some... arches or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, so so he asks for a white wine from yeah. from the bartender, who's this pretty brunette girl, young yeah, girl. they're like caterers. So they're yeah. just like, whatever. They pick so, these people so up. He, um, so he gets the glass of wine, and he goes to drink it. And she touches his hand, and he goes. Weirdly, she reaches out yeah. and touches his hand. I, I, I'd be very happy to have, yeah. have that happen to me. He's, but he's like taken aback, right? And she just says, "Like, oh, I wanted to touch you for good luck." What's interesting is this piece of music. Now, is it's a piece of Django Reinhardt music. Oh yeah, it's it's called Django's Bolero, and it 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 has a sort of like. First of all, it sounds like a Woody Allen soundtrack, but it has this sort of kind of a Latin feel to it. So you have that feeling, but there are these quick cuts of this close-up of her mouth and his, uh, her point, his point of view, right? Yes. Close-up of her mouth and, and her, her fidgeting hands and her brushing her hair back and whatnot, and it's intoxicating to him. The neck. It's not like he's looking at her breast. No, 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 no. I know there's a point here, yeah. though. He's yeah. not, it's not like this sex object. No. It's beauty. She's like a work of art. But these little elements, this yeah. this this 
coyish little girl, this nervous little girl, yeah. it's just intoxicating to you. Of My course. God, look at this. He's like, hey, I need an assistant. Right. I pay room and board. I give life lessons. You wouldn't know anybody that needs a job. So we, we see the next chapter starting right then and there. And the cycle continues. It's brilliant. It's 42 brilliant minutes. And the thing about New York stories is that Woody Allen, it's it's kind of a fun thing, but not a great Woody Allen. Francis Coppola, I don't know what he was thinking. I guess he just wanted to do a little present for his daughter because well, she here. she's quote unquote wrote it. Let's go back. All right. Because I remember when this came out and we were like, Woody Allen, Martin Scorsese, Francis Coppola yeah. doing doing films about New York New stories. York. So you thought this was going to be the best New York movie ever. Absolutely. And when you saw the first one, Martin Scorsese, you're like, oh, all right, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. What a great New York story. The art world, downtown, love. You know what I mean? It's just like everything. Perfect. And Richard Price. Yes. And then Coppola. It's like, what is Within that? seconds, you knew, oh, my God, it's time to go to the bathroom. What do we say? What are we, some fancy hotel? It was nothing about New York, really. It was supposed to be this fancified... Like sort of Eloise... Yeah, but... The Plaza Hotel. But I was, it was just so disappointing, in oh my a way, God. because you were hoping... Look, man, Coppola did one of the two best New York movies ever, the right. Godfather movies. Right. You can't get more New York than that. I, but I want to make a point. Yeah. Because I, I've heard Richard Price say this stuff okay. for, for some time in, in reading and in interviews. For all of Richard Price's griping, about his time in Hollywood and how pissed off, like I said before, he was when Scorsese didn't do Clockers. This 42-minute film is a testament, forever in celluloid, that these two guys, when they work together, not as some sort of gun for hire like it was when The Color of Money, but when they work together, holy cow. Yeah. Chills. It's beautiful. Yeah. You couldn't have picked a better pair for New York movies. No way. Well, that's all the time we have this week. We'd like to thank our friend Glenn Arnowitz for his music. And, of course, our listeners for tuning in. So join us next week for another episode of Film Detour. If you like our show, please recommend us to your friends. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetourpodcast.com to leave comments or email us with questions. You can also visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 